During the presidential election, then candidate Donald Trump vowed to make America great again for all Americans. But tonight, he's taking some heat for appearing to stack his cabinet with the super wealthy. Politico with the headline Trump's team of gazillionaires. Politico surmises that if Trump appoints folks like his education secretary, pick Betsy DeVos, as well as Rudy Giuliani, Mitt Romney, and others. His cabinet and administration could be worth as much as $35 billion. The New York Times Deputy Washington Editor, Jonathan Weissman, sarcastically tweeting, between some of those names and others, this is going to be quite the working class administration. In moments, we'll be joined by Anthony Scaramucci, a member of Donald Trump's transition team. We'll ask him about the criticism. But we begin with Peter Ducey reporting tonight from Palm Beach, Florida, outside Mar-a-Lago. Sandra, because working class voters propelled Donald Trump to the presidency, some on the left are now crying foul that the billionaire is surrounding himself with other billionaires. The two people who are reportedly the president elect's favorites for the top two spots at the Commerce Department, Wilbur Ross and Todd Ricketts, both billionaires. Another name swirling around as a possible cabinet member is Harold Hamm, an oil billionaire. And the education secretary he's already nominated, Betsy DeVos, comes from a family worth at least $5 billion. Politico did the math and speculates that if you add up the net worth of Trump's rumored cabinet secretaries, the sum could reach $35 billion. But the current administration behaved basically the same way when filling key positions, even nicknaming one proposal the Buffett Rule after the second richest person in the country, Warren Buffett. A quick look at President Obama's own cabinet room over the last eight years shows massive wealth. There's Commerce Secretary Penny Pritzker, a businesswoman from Chicago worth $2.4 billion. Her dad helped found Hyatt Hotels, and she grew up to lead a lucrative real estate business. Then Secretary of State John Kerry, worth $103 million, and also married to Heinz food processing heiress Teresa Heinz. And the Veterans Affairs Secretary Bob McDonald made $15.9 million in 2013 alone while working as the chief executive of Procter & Gamble. President Obama did bring aboard a Secretary of State who claimed to have been dead broke just a few years earlier, but as it turns out, that Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, was worth $15 million while in office and a whole lot more now. Sandra. All right, Peter, thank you. Joining us now, Anthony Scaramucci is a member of President-elect Donald Trump's transition team and served on Mr. Trump's Economic Advisory Council. Anthony, thanks for being here tonight. It's great to be here. Happy post-Thanksgiving. You too, sir. Can you clear some of this up? Because there is a lot of oh. talk about him surrounding himself with billionaires as if that's a bad thing. Well, I think the only thing that Peter left out is with the Trump bump, all of those people are a lot richer, including Warren Buffett, who's up yeah. $11 billion in the and last two weeks. And you're referencing the stock market rally we've yeah. seen since so, president. So I think, I think the, good, the good news is the denigration of wealthy people and the divisiveness of that sort of class warfare is sort of coming to an end. Uh, and I think that's a very good thing for the American people. The other thing that that article left out is that every one of these people, Sandra, is an unbelievable philanthropist, gives tons Betsy of money DeVos. away. She's an incredible philanthropist. In fact, she's dedicated her whole life to education, understanding the issues of education, and frankly, how to help poor people in indigent areas and in the inner cities get their children the quality education that they need so that they can have an aspirational working class conversion into the middle class and hopefully into the affluent. By the way, so, as Peter... So I think this is a fantastic thing for the American people that he's focused on meritocracy and talent as opposed to this nonsense of picking people uh, based on their net worth not being enough. As Peter pointed out at the top of his report, he said working class voters propelled Trump uh, to victory in this election. Now Democrats are crying foul. Well, isn't that a key point? This isn't Trump supporters that are crying foul saying we don't like what we're seeing. This is the left that is criticizing yeah, him the, for this. The, the left has got a series of talking points about railing on rich people. Uh, they think that that class division is a really powerful antidote for them, that they can get their people out to the polls. I think people are in general very, very tired of that. You know what people want? They want wage growth. They want jobs. They want quality education for their children. They want a right-sizing and an evening of the playing field as it relates to trade so that we can have super free trade. But let it be fair for the American people and for the American worker. And so if there are super distinguished people that have done amazing things with their lives, mm -hmm. that, that have led to the great American success story that you just heard about, then so be it. Let's let those people help the rest of us get to where we want to go. So let's clear up a couple other things as well, though, because when you dig into the, when you're uh, looking at um, 
uh, Munchen, uh, Munchen, right? Mnuchin. Uh, Mnuchin and yeah, Bannon. You would love the Munchen. I'm going to call him Munchen. Okay, tomorrow. well, you can yeah, tease him all you want. It's my fault. Sorry <laughs> about that. Um, and Bannon, uh, as yeah. we know, his Goldman Sachs background. I mean, you're talking about <laughs> Wall Street backgrounds. I, how important mm -hmm. is that? Considering Donald Trump said, you know, he made he made his election on the system is rigged. Well, a lot of Main Street and those that are making the average fifty-five thousand dollars a year in this country, mm -hmm. they think Wall Street's rigged. How is that for them to see him put well, people listen, from I'm Wall also, Street on his team? Well, I'm, I'm also a product of the Goldman Sachs, and I've worked on Wall Street for 28 years, and I've had this conversation with the president-elect, and I'll continue to say the same thing. There might be some bad actors on Wall Street. There's no question about that. But there are bad actors in many industries. But guys like Steve Bannon and, and Steve Mnuchin, in fact, they've been terrific people. Uh, they're high ethical, high integrity. Uh, I've worked very closely with both of those people. And I have a tremendous amount of confidence in them that they're going to do the right thing for the American people. But while you're here and we've got this news tonight on this divided transition team yeah, that you're seeing reports divided, all are yes. very divided. Um, but Mitt Romney, apparently, we saw the tweets from Kellyanne Conway today. Mm -hmm. How is it going? Can you let us know before you go? Well, first of all, as it relates to Kellyanne, I, I love her because she's been so instrumental in the success of the campaign. Everyone on the team respects her, and so she's entitled to her opinion, and she's sharing it with people over Twitter, so God bless. As it relates to the transition in general, I said this to Bloomberg, I said it in a press conference, the transition has been nothing but orderly. Uh, the information being provided that the president-elect and the vice president-elect... Is president -elect, still being considered? Who? Mitt Romney. Well, I, I, have to take, I have to take Vice President Pence at his word when he says he's being seriously considered for Secretary of State. I do think that there are other candidates in the field. And here's the thing that the, the message to the American people is that there's a very orderly, very disciplined process. And what the president-elect is doing, he's doing a wide-ranging search mm -hmm. so that when the people are finally declared, Sandra, he can say to the American people, listen, I really went through a rigorous recruiting process mm -hmm. and I picked the best person, or to quote Mr. Trump, a a++ plus plus player uh, is going to join the administration. So good to I, have look, you. I'm very proud to be a part of it with them, and uh, it's been a fantastic two weeks for us. And Busy. I, think the, I think the American people are going to be very excited about their new administration. Anthony Scaramucci, good of you to be good, here. Good to be here. Thanks, Andrew. Good to have you. You can see him with some unusual choices, uh, and even if they're even slightly controversial, they are the ones he's going to rely on, and we have to certainly understand that he needs to surround himself with people whose advice he can uh, uh, act upon. That's our early Trump supporter, Congressman Chris Collins of New York, on the latest picks right now, one of whom, Deputy National Security Advisor, you know very well. Here she is. Whether it's China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, radical Islam, they all tested, a new president always gets tested, but all these countries are lining up to test this new president. And here's Mr. Trump's statement about the hire of KT McFarland. Quote, I'm proud that KT has once again decided to serve our country and join my national security team. She has tremendous experience and innate talent that will complement the fantastic team we are assembling, which is crucial because nothing is more important than keeping our people safe. And another pick, Don McCann as White House Chief of Counsel. And here's Trump's statement about Mr. McCann. Quote, Don has a brilliant legal mind, excellent character, and a deep understanding of constitutional law. He will play a critical role in our administration, and I am grateful that he is willing to serve our country at such a high-level capacity. Let's bring in our panel now. Lisa Booth, columnist with the Washington Examiner. Karen Tumulty, national political correspondent for the Washington Post. And syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer. Charles, comments on the picks today. Well, KT, as we all know, is a... Superb a choice. She goes all the way back to Nixon and Kissinger administrations, uh, Reagan as well. She's very experienced. She's written. She's thought. Uh, and I think she'll be a really good balance to that team. McCann, I don't know, but I think his challenge is going to be, will he be the one to tell Donald uh, Trump that he has to divest himself of some of his investments, or perhaps even all of them, if he wants to have an administration that may not be, that will be within the law or certainly within sort of ethic limits that we would expect. That's going to be a tough uh, choice because uh, Trump is a unique president-elect, will be a unique president with all of his holdings in the world. But that's going to be a really difficult issue. 
and he'll rely on McGahn to give him the legal advice. Karen, you uh, had suggested just moments ago during the break that he's not a yes man, McCann. Uh, he's not. Interestingly enough, I, I, I was talking today to Bob Bauer, who had been Barack Obama's White House counsel, and he pointed out that McGahn is an ardent libertarian, which makes him suspicious of expansive executive power. And when he was at the Federal Election Commission, he was a, a real disruptor. So, um, so Bob Bauer said, you know, this is a guy in this office who is not going to be a yes man. Uh, he's a Naval Academy graduate, a former uh, FEC chairman uh, of the Federal Elections Commission, where he held, uh, according to his biograph, uh, biography at uh, the law firm Jones Day, where he works, that he led a revolution in campaign finance. The, the left uh, Center for Media and Democracy sees it very differently, noting that McCann played a lead role in transforming the FEC into a toothless watchdog. Lisa, that's their expression. Well, I guess it would depend on your vantage point. Right? Indeed. But no, he seems to have surrounded himself with a lot of independent thinkers, people that are known as mavericks. If you look at someone like Senator Sessions, he hasn't been afraid to buck the Republican Party. Someone like General Flynn has also been known as a maverick. So a lot of these independent thinkers who aren't necessarily yes men or women. Uh, but what I think is rep uh, important as, you know, a Republican is you look at the fact that Donald Trump, uh, right now we're looking at a really united Republican Party. And with some of the various picks that he has made so far, I think show good faith effort in trying to unite the Republican Party. You've got someone like Nikki Haley, who was very critical of him throughout the general election and, and the, or at least for the bulk or some of the general election and definitely throughout the, the primary race, uh, who is brought into the fold is, uh, you know, his you ambassador pick. Uh, so I, that's a positive sign for the Republican Party, bringing in some of these diverse voices uh, from the Republican Party uh, and trying to unite it moving forward, building that important coalition that he's going to need to get things done. I'd like to change subjects now to this uh, internal rivalry between uh, Mitt Romney and Rudy Giuliani, at least their backers who seem to be kind of duking it out behind, beside, uh, behind the scenes. Um, what do you make of this, Charles? I'm hearing some speculation that Romney may not be the top choice now, that, that Giuliani is rising to the surface and they're looking for this apology from Romney. Is that true? What do you make of it? Look, I think there's been a furious counterattack by loyalists who were with uh, Trump from the beginning when it was rather unfashionable. And Romney, of course, was the lead attacker, the lead uh, critic of Trump in the, the late primaries general election. So I understand why they feel it's a matter of loyalty. Uh, you know, Trump's going to have to choose. If it's loyalty, he's not going to choose Mitt Romney. If it's, uh, if it's choosing who would be the best man for the job, uh, I think probably if you had an independent uh, panel, they might, you know, marginally prefer a Mitt Romney, simply because he has less of baggage than Giuliani. And as Trump himself has said, he looks the part. I mean, he looks like he was born to be a Secretary of State. I don't know whether that means he would be a good one or not. But I do think we should keep an eye on a third possibility that would resolve the issue by not resolving it. And that would be David Petraeus, who to the world represents America at its strongest and most decisive. He's the guy who saved the Iraq War and is a man who's written and thought deeply about the new kind of warfare that we're involved in. And that, I think, would be a spectacular choice. Karen, this loyalty question is really rising to the surface now. I had a, a former Bush administration senior advisor tell me about a rivalry within the State Department during the Bush years, and there were two distinct camps there. The rivalry was so intense there that one camp would send out leaks to the media trying to block information from the other camp, a rivalry that was so intense that it escaped the attention of the president himself. This is a serious matter. Well, the, but the question would be, were Mitt Romney to get the job, uh, whether he would then staff the, the State Department bureaucracy with people who were loyal to him, or whether the White House would want to have their own people in these jobs. The, the idea, though, that he is going to somehow back down from the criticism that we heard him, him making of Donald Trump throughout this presidential campaign, I don't think is going to happen. I mean, this is a guy who titled his 2012 campaign book, No Apology. So I think with Mitt Romney, I, you're going to have to take Mitt Romney as you get him. And there is this question, I, I raised it with Ed Henry earlier, Lisa, uh, that if he were to make an apology and not get the job, it would be very embarrassing for him. 
Well, oh, absolutely. I mean, he staked a lot of ground in going after Donald Trump uh, throughout the election. You know, giving that big speech was which was more than any ever any, than any other uh, important figure like him did, uh, as far as you know, pointing out uh, his flaws as a as a candidate. Uh, but again, it's back to the coalition building in my my perspective. And so I think if you top someone like uh, Governor Mitt Romney, you know, that helps heal the Republican Party, helps build that coalition. Because if you look at the Senate, Republicans are probably going to end up with 52 Republicans in the Senate. Donald Trump doesn't have, uh, you know, big margins there, so he's going to need to bring the party together. And I really think we've seen him take good faith efforts to try to unite the party, whether it's giving the nod uh, to Paul Ryan to run again as Speaker of the House, or tapping some of these different individuals, even someone, as I mentioned before, like Nikki Haley, who's been critical, or Governor Mitt Romney, who has definitely been uh, probably his biggest critic. I, I think that would go a long way in uniting the party. And Charles, lastly, uh, one observer noted to me that uh, Donald Trump has this way of, you know, throwing the shiny object over here, the media will go running over there, and then he might surprise you with an entirely different pick. Uh, John Bolton, for example, comes to mind. Right, although he came to the floor early, he's a faded. He was also furiously attacked, not because he was anti-Trump, but because he's a so-called neocon, a word that is thrown around Washington without any meaning, but has baggage from the uh, decisions made in the Bush years. But I think the one person who might come out of the cold or might come out as a shiny surprise would be Petraeus. Thank you. Joining me now, Kevin Jackson, conservative radio host and Fox News contributor, and Atima Omara, political strategist and Virginia Democratic National Committee member. Thanks to both of you for being here tonight. Uh, Kevin, I'll start with you first. What do you make of these protests that you're seeing uh, right down the magnificent mile there in Chicago again? Well, the real question might be, do black jobs matter? Because they're certainly interrupting a lot of the uh, cash flow that retailers will have these days. But back as far as the protest goes, it's a legitimate protest. Laquan McDonald was shot. Rahm Emanuel covered it up because of electioneering and uh, wanting to not be embroiled in a Ferguson-like situation. And so it's a legitimate thing. But I think in terms of where the uh, passion lies, it should go against uh, Rahm, Rahm Emanuel and not the police. Well, and to the be police fair, some of the, the protests, some of the chants that they are chanting are to get rid of Rahm Emanuel. Uh, but Atim, I want to bring you in here because I want to hear from you. What are they asking for? What do these protesters want? Well, from what I've read and what the protesters want is, you know, what a lot of these protests around the country are asking for is for better relationships between police and the community. And how do they because, think they're going to yeah. accomplish that, Atima, by, by trying to stop commerce in the city of Chicago? Well, I mean, honestly, no protest is ever effective when you're having it, let's say, on, on Tuesday on a, in the middle of the day. Of course, we're talking about it now because it's on, on Black Friday when a lot of shoppers are out there. So they're doing their job. Most successful protests have been at times when it's high traffic and a lot of people are out and about. So obviously, they got the attention that they were looking for. Um, but they're looking for, you know, civilian account a, civ a civilian accountability council that has an independent council that can work with police <laughs> on building better relations, specifically with the community. I mean, yes, it could come certainly top down from the mayor. I wouldn't dispute that. Kevin, but, that. I, I, but you, you look but the at police commissioner sets that agenda, obviously. But Kevin, you look at these protests and you just wonder: is there is there a better way than? then uh, by trying to do what they see as the right thing by doing something like shutting down retailers, blocking customers from walking right. through their doors? Well, of, of course there's a better way. And, and the, the idea that they really want to have a better relationship with police is unfortunately uh, betrayed by the idea that they're going around killing police. So if you really want to have a dialogue with police, okay. you've got to Kevin, be honest about what, what's I going on. I want to get to the question, okay. though, that we, we, no, and I want to get to this uh, with both of you. Are we going to see changes coming with the Donald Trump DOJ, especially talking about Senator Jeff Sessions as attorney general? Will we see changes, mm -hmm. Kevin, as, as to how they deal with groups yeah. like Black Lives Matter? Well, first of all, I don't think the uh, onus is on Donald Trump. We've been dealing with this issue now for decades, and it's generally at the hands of the Democrats, like Rahm Emanuel and, and uh, the Baltimore mayor and many others in these large cities that are run by typically uh, mayors of, uh, that are Democrats and particularly black mayors. But is Donald Trump going to address it? I think he will. I think that he's going to take a tougher stance with respect to law and order. I think that the actual conversation between police and the black community does need to be had, but not lopsided the way the left Akeem, tends I to I want to get your it. thoughts on that. What do you expect from President-elect Trump's DOJ? Oh, well, President-elect, well, I, what I would expect, of course, would be what has been upheld, which is the DOJ is the largest, is the nation's cop 
they uh, go into police departments that are doing civil rights violations. That's what was done with Baltimore. That was done, obviously, with Ferguson. Now, with given Sessions' history, having actually praised Trump as recently as August of 2016 on calling for the death of five men called the Central Park Five, most people know that, way after the years after they were exonerated. He believes in stop and frisk, which is something that is not even legally upheld in the United States, or well, certainly at least. Sure, it has um, been. Kevin, the I'll court, let you. I'll, the I, court I, I don't have much time left. Kevin, I'll get your not. response to that. Oh, you now? Yep. I'm sorry, I thought she, she was still continuing. Last word to you. Uh, look, a lot of, oh, no, a lot I, of the no. policies, a, a lot of the policies that she's talking about are they are legal. And they do they do prevent crime. Wasn't held and, up by a you know, court the, in New York. The, the, well, you know that that may be true, but it's not illegal. So, but the pro, the part the point is this: these these policies do work. They do stop crime in the neighborhoods where they should be stopping crime. All right, I, I, I will stop you there. It's good of both of you to come on. Conversation will continue. Thank you.